Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I think some of our uh, fellow attendees may have uh, been on their way, may have had a, a nice evening last night. So it's my pleasure to welcome you and reconnect you here at Capacity Asia in our wonderful new home of Singapore. Three years it's been since we were last able to connect in person, so it's good to see everyone back together and the industry continuing to thrive. Uniting the digital, eco digital infrastructure ecosystem in one place has long been our aim with this event. And diversity in the room is testament to that, or at least the diversity here uh, across the few days. Uh, we have leaders from over 300 companies representing carriers, data center, subsea, cloud, tower, fiber, finance, hyperscale, and more. Yesterday, we dedicated an afternoon to the subsea industry at a time when many new competitive cable routes, both intra-Asia and intercontinental, are being proposed, and the intrinsic link between data centers and subsea cables is becoming more evident. Further to this, we return at a time when the largest growth globally is happening here in Asia. We're adapting and expanding into a new era of digital infrastructure across the region. Investment managers are raising bigger and bigger digital infrastructure funds. Relationships and synergies are being forged as new connectivity hubs are growing, as convergence continues throughout the ecosystem. It's this cooperation that is the starting point for a resilient Asian hyperscale network, responding to the enormous customer demand growth, as well as changing expectations from a young, young population. Carriers are monetizing assets and refocusing business, looking for new revenue streams and products to offer, whilst embracing new technologies to enhance customer experience. I've included here a few stories just from the past two months that we've covered to show the extent of what's happening in the ecosystem. We've got a diverse market of data centers growing exponentially, and crucially, the importance of people that are driving all of this growth. Over the course of the next two days, we'll be joined by over 65 speakers, representing some of the biggest players around, from Meta, Equinix, and NTT, to Starhub, Telin, Colt, Axiata, Verizon, and many more. Before introducing our 2022 keynote speakers, we have some people to thank. Starting with our diamond sponsors, NTT and China Unicom, our platinum sponsor, China Telecom, our gold sponsors, China Mobile International and PCCW Global, Console Connect, and our silver sponsors, Otterglobe and Princeton Digital Group, and our bronze sponsors for supporting us in this year's event. We wouldn't be here without them, so please give them a thanks. Thank you also to China Mobile International for hosting a brilliant welcome drinks last night. And you'll be pleased to hear that China Telecom will be hosting tonight's reception from 5.30, and China Unicom will host closing drinks tomorrow. Plenty of networking to look forward to, and plenty of opportunities to forge the relationships required to build stronger digital infrastructure in the region. So on to today's opening keynote session. We're focusing on the regulatory environment, and you'll be pleased to hear and I'd like to welcome to the stage Priya Mahajan, Head of APAC Policy for Verizon, and Ismail Shah, Head of Connectivity and Access Policy APAC at Meta. Well, a uh, uh, very warm good morning to all of you, and thank you for being here today. Uh, what, we're going to have a conversation amongst us between me and Ismail, and we've, uh, we've kind, we were conspiring behind backstage and thinking what are we going to talk about, because uh, apparently there was a moderator who was supposed to show up, but she couldn't travel because of some other commitments. So we thought we'll keep it more uh, engaging and conversational with you guys so that everybody gets, gets a chance to ask questions if they want and have a more conversation with us. Uh, over the next probably 20, 25 minutes, uh, we'll, we'll lay out a few issues that we see from a telecom provider perspective and from Ismail's, from Meta's perspective, and then probably we can have a bit of conversation. 
So I'll begin with the, in a short introduction about myself. So uh, I'm Priya Mahajan. I'm uh, head of public policy for Verizon in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I work with policymakers, regulators, and trade associations on digital tech policy issues of interest to Verizon. Uh, telecom access, data privacy, cybersecurity are some of those issues that I work very closely with. I'm also the president of uh, Asia Pacific Carriers Coalition. It's an industry association of global carriers operating in the region, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, a little bit about Verizon. I'm sure everybody knows about Verizon. We are a, a large, uh, largest, one of the largest wireless providers in the U.S. Uh, and we also have a global IP backbone that spans uh, about six continents. But what is really unique about Verizon internationally is the fact that we do not operate in the consumer space or in the wireless space, but we do provide uh, services to Fortune 500 companies and these are typically enterprise data services. So our play is typically uh, to connect these companies through our advanced networking solutions and our security solutions and give them a full suite of uh, you know, solu ICT solutions. And to Verizon, future is all about the power of connection, connecting uh, human beings, machines, and companies. And uh, connecting them in a seamless and secure manner is something that we bring to the table through our, uh, through our high, high uh, cutting edge technology solutions. So with that, I'll just pause and maybe pass it on to Ismail for a brief introduction. Thank you very much, Priya. And I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for the invitation to speak at this panel. My name is Ismail Shah. As you can see, I am the head of connectivity and access policy for APAC at Meta. And I'm sure all of you know about Meta and the mission that we have to connect the communities and people. And we have a suite of applications, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, and many more to come. Uh, and we are also working on different new products on uh, related to augmented reality and virtual reality and mixed reality for the future. And uh, you may have heard about Metaverse. That's something that we see coming in five to 10 years that we are working on. Uh, I joined Meta in June 2022. Before that, I was at the United Nations Organization Specialized uh, Agency for ICTs known as ITU. I was heading the area office in Jakarta. And just before joining that, I was a regulator myself. So that's what we are going to talk about. I was the cha chairman of the Pakistan Telecommunication Authority. And I can share some experiences from that and then ITU and then Meta uh, as we go along. So, Priya. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ismail. There's a mic available there, Ismail. Oh. So, uh, we, we have uh, what we're going to focus upon, I think, for the first sesh, first round of the discussion is more about our experiences operating in the, in globally as a telecom provider and also in the region. And what are the key trends we are looking at in terms of regulatory policy? And since the focus of today's discussion is how is regulatory policy shaping connectivity in the region? So we'll probably, I'll uh, probably focus on uh, our experience operating in this region and what we, we believe is, do, is, is needed to further propel and accelerate uh, the digital connectivity. So with that, let me begin by sharing some of the data points about Verizon. So Verizon, uh, as I mentioned initially in my remarks, we operate uh, in about 150 countries across the globe. And uh, typically, we, uh, we have our own you know, cable capacities and infrastructure through which we operate. And we also have leverage up a strong partner relationship wherever we, we are able to do that. So I think we, we are in a very good uh, in a very st strong and impressionable condition to provide services to our enterprise customers uh, across the region. Um, I'll, I'll probably kick off my remarks uh, for the first, uh, first side would be on focusing on what we are seeing in terms of regulatory trends. So I think the three clear trends we are seeing uh, is in the Asia Pacific region, as you can all imagine, it's a highly diverse region and we see policymakers ad adopting different approaches to regulation. And that is something as a global carrier we find very hard to navigate because uh, as a carrier and being in the telecom business, which is highly uh, infrastructure and, uh, you know, in, uh, I would say investment, uh, heavily on investment, we would 
probably look at something, uh, a regulatory landscape which is more consistent, which is more predictable. Uh, however, what we, we really end up doing is to navigate through different regulatory regimes in the, in the region and uh, bringing all the uncertainty and also an onerous compliance cost. So that's one of the big challenges that most of the global companies, global carriers are facing in especially navigating through different policy regimes in the region. And even within those policy regimes, one of the big uh, challenges for us is the is the new policy regimes that are emerging on data flows. And we can probably talk about data flows as a, as a, as a topic, a subtopic in the next uh, segment of the discussion. But I think from our perspective, what we are really seeing different approaches, approaches being implemented by the policy makers to address some of the concerns that they are seeing more from uh, digital sovereignty or data sovereignty perspective. But that ends up actually stifling uh, innovation investments. Uh, that are really needed to propel the digital revolution in, in this uh, region. So I, I, I'll just pause here maybe and Ismail, pass it on to you to share your thoughts yeah. on what trends you are seeing in this region. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, anyone who has worked in this uh, APAC region would uh, ag probably agree with me that uh, there is lots of diversity in this, in this region. So you see, and the same you see in regulations and policies also. And then there is a historical perspective to this whole thing, where the regulations and, and, and kind of policy related to this digital space, whether where it started from and why is it in a shape that it is right now. So if you, I take you back maybe around uh, 30 to 35 years, uh, you will see that the regulation, the, at least at that time, which was mostly telecom regulations, many of the regulators came into being uh, in the 90s. Uh, and the reason was that private sector was actually allowed uh, to, to provide telecom related services during that time. Some of them, of course, are, were before the 80s, like FCC has been there for quite a, a while. But there were many regulators who were actually formed at that time. And then the private sector entered the business. And the main function of the regulator was actually to provide a level playing field because government was also in the business of providing telecom. But then we had development in the technology and we had the internet, but the policies were not, and the regulations were not able to, to keep pace with that. Now, if you look at the regulations at that time, you know, you have the nationalistic approach because these were national uh, licenses that the telecom operators were given and they were operating within a boundary of a country. And you still see some of those things still being applied uh, to the internet or the digital space, which is global in nature. So this, that's why things have become difficult. And uh, while the technology evolved, the services evolved, we had new players coming in, but in many countries, the regulations actually and the policies lagged behind. And there were many uh, nationalistic kind of approaches adopted towards the regulation, which actually hurt uh, the sector. And we still see that to a varying degree in different countries. Uh, and we can talk about that a little more. Uh, but that is actually stopping, uh, you know, the, the actual advantage that you have with the whole digital ecosystem, whether that is connectivity, whether that is, you know, bringing the global companies into your country, but also actually taking the companies that you have to, to, to have a global outreach. And we have examples of that. Those who have worked in this region would know about uh, Gojek, for example. Tokopedia, they would know. And, and there, these are just some examples. There are so many others who have actually been able to, to function or to, to reach a scale because of the, the, the platform, the digital platform that they had. A very interesting point, and that's about how regulation has failed to keep pace with the evolving technology trends. And uh, I have I have a favorite line which I generally use, and I and this is I think for a, reg, a 21st century regulatory and a digital economy, you need a 21st century policy tool. And what we are seeing today is applying of the same uh, regulatory approaches to the new age technology services with probably legacy out, out, uh, and outdated regulations. And that, that is really hampering and probably stifling a lot of innovative services from being provided to the end users. 
Uh, you spoke about digital sovereignty and data sovereignty as an issue, and I think that's a theme that all of us, at least in this Asia-Pacific region, have been seeing propping up uh, in different shapes. So I'll talk about three trends, especially as it relates to data flows as an issue for global, global companies. First of all, what we are seeing in this region, some of the policy makers are looking at data autonomy. And a classic example of data autonomy as a concept being introduced is, is China, where we are seeing a lot of policies being enacted, be it the personal information protection law or the data security law, wherein they, uh, the policy makers are actually looking at uh, you know, introducing mandates on how data can be, some kind of kind of data which can be stored in country and cannot be transferred at all outside of that country. The other trend that we are seeing, which is emerging in, in some of the matured markets, is uh, around digital sovereignty, which really means that some kind of data cannot be moved outside of that country. And a classic example of that would be Australia. And you guys would be surprised because Australia is generally known for its pro-business and uh, generally a very robust uh, regulatory environment. But uh, for example, health sector data cannot be uh, transferred or cannot be shared across borders uh, for, as per the regulatory requirements in Australia. So that's another trend about digital sovereignty. And the last trend that we are seeing, which is again very disturbing and emerging in countries like India, where the regulators would allow data to be transferred across borders subject to some conditions being met. At the same time, they also require a copy of their data or a mirror copy of that data being stored in country. And this effectively is actually ensuring that the operators or the providers are actually spending a lot on storage of their data in country. So uh, one of the uh, classic example was the central government of India, which is RBI, issued a mandate for payment system companies to store their payment systems data in country. And, uh, f uh, f having a mirror copy of that in country. So this actually ended up uh, restricting a lot of uh, providers in, in not being able to offer services because of the high storage and compliance costs. So uh, given these three, uh, three trends that are emerging from a data flows perspective, so Verizon and a couple of other like-minded organizations, uh, we, we formed an alliance with one of the uh, trade associations and we came out with a report and it's available online. It's uh, uh, by Global Data Alliance. It's a primer on telecommunications. And this, this report looks at the, the issue of cross-border data flows from the angle of different industries and how it impacts those industries as and when the policymakers are actually imposing any localization requirements on the businesses, how much of that impacts uh, the end user because ultimately all of the service providers would be using that data and cross-border data flows to the advantage of providing services to the end users or consumers. So uh, one of the key findings of our report was that countries that are applying, that are adopting more liberal approaches to cross-border data flows are actually promoting a lot of innovation and investments. And when we talk about Asia Pacific as a region, I think what we really need in this region is policymakers taking again a very light touch approach to the issue of cross-border data flows. And Singapore is a very good example, I would say, who's, and they have been at the forefront of coming together with some approaches that would allow at least data flows amongst the ASEAN markets. I think that's a very, very good approach and a welcome step by one of the regulators to kind of move forward. And uh, another big initiative by Singapore is um, and they have been getting into digital economy agreement with a lot of uh, like-minded countries. Uh, and those uh, digital economy agreements have actually uh, binding commitments, uh, especially on data flows amongst the participating countries. So I think it's a good start, uh, a welcome move, and we would rather encourage policymakers to look at these best practices model to promote uh, innovation in this uh, in this region. Maybe Ismail, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you. And I think after this we can uh, involve the audience because we just don't want to speak amongst each other. Uh, I'll just have another example that's more like related to the theme, which is the connectivity part. Like if you look at the subsea or submarine cables related to regulations, you see lots of you know different approaches. Again, uh, some of them uh, may not be actually uh, feasible, it may not be useful for the overall connectivity. And one of the reasons that I see is that it's not only one uh, organ of the depart of the government that is involved, like for example, it's not just the ICT regulator, it may also involve the 
the marine uh, ministry, you know, the environmental uh, ministry, and many others who are involved in there. Then you have the uh, issues related to defining certain corridors, and then again, certain laws, for example, the capotage law that are involved in there. So it's actually the overall environment and the not just the ICT, but you know, the other ministries and government as a whole who need to look at uh, these issues uh, in a holistic manner rather than each one of them pushing their own uh, requirements, which they don't know about. So for example, when certain corridors are defined, that only those can be used for the subsea cables, that also results in vulnerabilities uh, of the overall network that you have in the country. So we'll stop here, I believe, and I, I mean, if you agree, then and, and involve the audience and get their comments and questions. Yeah, I think that's that's a good suggestion. Just want to add one point here. And you spoke about regulatory simplification. I think it's a very very important point, especially as we see that investments and in, uh, in infrastructure are very very capital intensive. So what uh, what the carriers really need is regulatory predictability and certainty and simplification of regulations. Doing away with some of the outdated voice centric legacy uh, regulation would be actually a welcome step forward. So I totally agree with you on that. Thanks. Thanks. So now we uh, maybe you should open. Yeah. Maybe we can open up, and if there's someone who wants to make a comment or a question, we could we could probably have a conversation on that. Come on, don't be shy. And I can donate my my um, my mic for that. <laughs> okay, we have one. Okay, maybe we can stand also, and so that they feel more comfortable. <laughs> yes. So any any comment, question? Yes, please. Yeah, um, thank you for the discussion. My name is Ubed Raman from Exiata Group. So uh, from a regulatory landscape perspective, as a hyperscaler, I would ask you first, what do you want to see in terms of you know, this cohesive, um, coherent approach being taken in the region? Yeah, thank you very much. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, that we, if you look at the nature of the internet, I mean, it has many components now the digital infrastructure, which is not just the hardware and all, but these all the connectivity-related aspect, the subsea cables, then you have the spectrum, then you have the right-of-way, and then you have policies related to the, the uh, as was mentioned, related to the data flow and so on. And they need uh, to be, there. Need, there is a need that we have, you know, international best practices being followed there in every aspect of these. That's number one. And secondly, we need a collaborative approach between all the government departments and the private sector. So because once you have, you know, the private sector, the industry involved in that, they are, they are equal stakeholders, I believe. So whenever there is some kind of change or when you are coming up with a law or regulation, the, you follow the international best practices and involve all the stakeholders, whether from the government, the private sector, academia, civil society, so that you don't end up with regulations that are either not implementable or regulations that are going to hurt your own economy in the long run? I think as a carrier and in line with our presence in the region, in Asia Pacific region, as I mentioned, we don't operate in the wireless space and we don't provide services to consumers. I think as an enterprise provider, what we really need from regulators is to recognize the specificity for enterprises and not to apply consumer-centric regulations on us. And I'll give you a classic example of that. Now, most of the regulations that we see emerging in this region are morely, most uh, most likely in keeping in interest of the consumers in mind, right? Consumer protection is a big angle in all those regulations. But if you really look at companies like Verizon and, uh, and other operators who are operating in the enterprise space, we don't really end up uh, being caught, we should not be caught with, the, with those regulations. The reason being that our customers are typically enterprise customers who do not actually uh, have the same kind of concerns because one, their agreements are highly bespoke and highly negotiated. They are in a better bargaining position with us in terms of negotiations. So I think the consumer protection angle is not really relevant there. So what, the, what we really need from policymakers is to start applying uh, 
differentiated approach to regulation. And we can't really have one size fit approach for enterprise and consumer, because what we really end up being doing as an enterprise provider is complying with those regulations which are like meaningless, right? It doesn't serve the purpose of the consumer, it doesn't serve the purpose of the regulator and the business. So all the stakeholders, and at Verizon we talk about four stakeholders for us. I think consumer is a, big, is a stakeholder, very, very important stakeholder for us. And whatever we should be doing, both from a policy and regulatory perspective should be to further the interest of the consumer. So I think a differentiated approach to regulation between enterprise and consumer is really, really important for us. Thanks. So um, totally agree with you because you know I sit on the MNO side as well as a carrier. So we, we face similar ch challenges as you. Uh, you know, um, hearing from both of you, I think you know there's a, a kind of a demarcation or delineation between advocacy and lobbying. So you know we are lobbying in terms of you know all this consumer, customer-centric you know regulation and policies. But from an advocacy perspective, I think there's a little bit more that needs to be done in the region. You know, an outside-in view rather than an inside inside-out view. And and that's where a little bit of cohesion, cohesiveness needs to come in from from our perspective as well. We operate in multiple markets, but each market has its own nuances, you know, differences. So that needs to be basically stitched up together. And I think, you know, that's where we as collectively need to work together. I think, you know, this was a topic that was discussed yesterday as well in one of the sessions. No, I think that's, that's a great point. And there are multiple opportunities available where policymakers are actually looking at the complete review of the regulatory framework. Like in India, the telecom bill is out, right? And we're all uh, going to be having the opportunity to participate in that conversation. So I totally agree with you on that. We need to be more cohesive in our approach and collaborate with like-minded associations in informing the policy debates. And I think for policymakers also, this is a new dimension that's being brought to their notice because uh, what we've seen, all of us at least, I have been in the telecom for more, more than 20 years, and what we've really seen is more voice-centric voice and consumer-centric regulations being introduced. And now we're talking about IP and the whole movement to data. So I think for even for policymakers, we as private sector need to do a uh, bit of informing them about and uh, maybe keeping them up to speed with what's really happening on operator side and then getting the right outcomes from a policy perspective. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, actually it's not exactly adding to that, but in general, like just uh, that uh, the fact that you are a regulatory agency doesn't mean that you have to regulate everything. Some things are better left alone. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, my name's Chris Patton from Northern Rose Fulbright. I had a question about multilateral consensus, and I guess, in your opinion, what multilateral organisation is the most likely to help you achieve a unified regulatory framework in this region? The follow-on question to that is, do you alternatively think, particularly as organisations with the strong support of, of your host government, that in some situations lobbying and exemptions to try to keep a practical level or unified framework is a, is a better outcome in the long run? Yes, yeah, so unified at uh, what level? Like within the country or across the region? Across the region, yeah. yeah. A more consistent framework. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so usually I gave this example, the, you know, the technologies are the same. I mean, it's like when you have, let's take an example of the cellular technology, 4G, for example. You, if you deploy it in Singapore, or whether you deploy it in Cambodia, whether you deploy it wherever, it will be the same. What the difference would be, the main difference would be between the different policies that each of the government uh, adopt. And now I agree with you that we have reached a stage. Uh, and, and again, these are all just providing connectivity. The ultimate aim actually is to be uh, to have the digital infrastructure is for enablement. The actual thing is the digital transformation, which is a very elusive term, but basically it's kind of, you know, using digital technologies to serve, uh, to provide services to the people, and whether it's the government providing it or the private sector or different platform providers. So that would mean that, and again, there are interdependencies. Uh, again, I'll give you the example that uh, many, some of you are probably in this business, the subsea cables. Unless we have like consistent policies, you are connecting many countries together. 
So you cannot have many different kind of policies and competing interests as we see now in this region for the subsea cables uh, infrastructure to be a, an efficient one and to be deployed also efficiently and uh, in a timely manner. So yes, I agree with you that we need to have for for at least some of the things we need to have unified policies. If it was up to me, I would even suggest that we need to have uh, unified policies for the whole uh, sector. But now the thing is, how do you achieve that? That's one of the important uh, aspects. So in ASEAN, for example, I see that there is at least a forum that has been provided where data uh, and information is, I mean, information regarding regulations and policies is exchanged. So we can start with a sub-regional level, and then maybe we can slowly and gradually progress towards a, a regional level. But again, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult because of many other sectors which are beyond, which are not related to this sector, which also, you know, drive your, your policies. So also having a dream of having a unified policy across the region would be different, but what we can start is with a sub-regional level. Yeah, I think uh, we are still some time away from the EU-like harmonized regulatory framework. And as Ismail pointed out, I think in, in Asia Pacific, all of us know that all, these, all the countries are actually at a different level, economic, social, political levels, right? So it, it's difficult to get them together on a table and have them agree on some binding commitments unless they are on, on the same kind of page. But, but what we are seeing, very interesting and I would say encouraging trends from an industry perspective is some policymakers, some countries are actually take, playing that thought leadership role in driving unified approaches, especially in areas like data flows, which really helps everybody, right? It, it helps the industry and the government. So we are seeing some of those uh, positive and promising developments emerging where countries like Singapore are playing a more thought leadership role and getting everybody on the table, including the public sector and the private sector, and agreeing on some of the common frameworks that will help businesses and the government and ultimately end up in consumers having more freedom of choice. So, so we see that emerging, but I think Asia as, as, as a region is still some time away from a EU style of harmonized approach is what my opinion is. Yes. <laughs> I mean, every country would also like, for example, uh, one of the interests could be that they want their companies to be in the part of the consortium in order for the cable to land. And many of you would have this experience. And then the other country would have different regulations and, and so on. So at time, it becomes difficult to have certain routes uh, in the cable. So I'll, I'll stop here. We can discuss it offline if you want. Actually, every country wants, but then they have their own policies also. Okay. Uh, my name is Fernando Paquette. I'm from Datacom Consulting, Asia Pacific. Uh, my question is, take into account the relevance of LEO satellites. How is relevant in your regulatory agenda, both from a carrier perspective and from hyperscaler? You know, things like Starlink, the way they were able to have interconnectivity through uh, between between the satellites and then give connectivity to consumers in that particular. How is relevant this in your agenda? So, I mean, satellite has been playing a very important role in connectivity. I mean, what was there before all the subsea cables? It was mostly the satellites, geostationary ones, and the technology advanced and now we have MEOs and LEOs and all. So I do see an important role, but we have to see the kind of business model that they would offer, the after-sales services and, and, and many other areas that they need to, to work on. The, the price also, the cost of the devices, the service and, and all. And uh, I think the, especially if you see most of those uh, providers are not from this region, so presence in this region, uh, so that uh, they, they, they are able to provide better services. But I, I do see a place 
for uh, connectivity. You know, in, in this region, if you see, we have so many countries, like if you look at Indonesia, thousands of, of, uh, of islands, and similarly in Philippines, uh, but there are also many, many people in other countries who are not connected uh, yet. So it can play a very important role uh, in that, but the price, the price of the devices, the cost of service and continuity of service after sales service, all that would play a role. But from our point of view, yes, any form of connectivity is really good to, to have. Yeah, I think you've pretty much covered everything. Uh, to us, it's also about connectivity underpinning every other sector of the economy and how, how far we can go. And in fact, Verizon had, has entered into partnership with other companies who are actually in this space. So uh, yes, I think this is an emerging space. As you rightly mentioned, there are other issues to be figured out, but definitely an interesting space and to watch out. Yeah. OK, so over to Chris. Thank you so much, Ismail and Priya, for kind of coming together for that conversation and for everyone that got involved. Um, I'm sure there's plenty more questions, so feel free to connect um, following the session. Again, you know, thank you for what is somewhat impromptu uh, conversation, but I hope it was enjoyable and I hope everyone got some takeaways there. Um, so thank you for coming along. In a couple of minutes, we'll be diving into investment across the digital infrastructure ecosystem. So please st stick around uh, for that panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you.